go through what the, the again, this is the executive's proposal, um, what the broad, um, the broad framework was for each of the District 1 areas. Um, in Admiral, the primary principle the executive used is with, in communities with high access to opportunity and low risk to displacement, they propose a little bit larger of a bump to support transit and other community principles. Existing family zoning is proposed to be with a new zoning called RSL, residential small lot, and low rise, within the, only within the urban village. No urban village expansion for Admiral. And um, one, of the, one of the zoning principles was to support mixed-use corridor on California, uh, again, up to neighborhood commercial 75. For the junction, the principles the executive used in developing the proposal, um, again, uh, high access to opportunity, low risk of displacement, slightly larger bump. Um, along with the larger bump comes a larger um, housing obligation. Ex there is an expansion for the junction uh, to include a 10-minute walk shed to transit. Small expansion, you can see it on the map. Uh, the dark line is drawn out. Then, similarly, the single family within the the um, the urban village is proposed to be to go to RSL or low rise. And the objective is to create transitions from California, Alaska, and Fauntleroy. Um, and further to explore, uh, support mixed use nodes and corridors up to 95 feet in height. South Park, community with high risk of displacement, proposed minimum bumps throughout the urban village. Existing single family is only proposed to go to RSL, residential small lot. No urban village expansion. And the commercial zones remain commercial, uh, neighborhood commercial. Westwood. Uh, Westwood, again, high risk of displacement, minimum bump. Uh, Minimum bump, as I should say, throughout the urban village except near frequent transit. The existing single family is proposed to go only to RSL. There's also no urban village expansion. The commercial zones become uh, neighborhood commercial, which obviously is a form of commercial, um, allows for some mixed use. And then support for existing mixed use node at Westwood Village, allowing the zoning to go up to 75 feet in a long Delridge way, um, up to neighborhood commercial 55. So that's the you know broad overview of the executive's proposal. I've been working with community members in each of these five areas to develop amendments. And in that second pack of, Rick, can I get? Can we get it? <laughs> I got it. Um, in the second handout, um, you can see that. So this is the overview of all of the amendments throughout District 1, and then it's broken up uh, into specific amendments for specific areas. So, for instance, this uh, location here, 1-1, uh, one, one, that's the location of La Rustica, and community members um, asked that I propose an amendment to not uh, apply MHA and the additional zoning there. Um, and everything's, uh, the amendments are all described. Um, on this one pager. Uh, on, um, in the junction, there are a number of amendments. I think the <laughs> most significant change I'm proposing for the junction, uh, based on the feedback I've received from folks there um, in uh, West Seattle Junction, is that the um, single family only go to RSL. Um, the proposal has a single family going to um, RSL, low rise one and as high I think as uh, low rise three in some instances. And the community has made what I think is a really, really good argument that um, they're interested in taking on more density, but they want to have those conversations in conjunction with planning, stationary planning around sound transit. So we don't know exactly where the line's going to go and dependent on that is really dependent on where you want to increase the zoning to allow for, for more dense housing in those in those walk sheds around the, um, the station. So um, I've, I've proposed those amendments uh, in um, the last committee meeting on uh, Friday. And um, there are some differing opinions among my colleagues. 
Um, I'm not the only council member who is proposing uh, more gradual upzones than what has been proposed. Uh, council member Johnson, council member O'Brien, council member Juarez, and council member Harrell um, all have um, for their district some small areas. Um, and again, if you look at the if you look at the large map, you can see. Um, that it's the purple areas within the, the larger dotted areas. So we're, we're really talking about small tweaks um, in, in what is proposed based on community desires. Um, but unfortunately, this is being um, cast by some council members as well as the public as watering down the mandatory housing affordability. Um, for the junction, for example, the added, the revenue generated um, for housing development would only affect the total number of units projected to be developed by a, about another 30 units. So it's, you know, what I would consider de minimis, and I think it's, it's so, I think, it's so hopeful to me that um, the communities in, who have been working in, with me in these urban villages um, have actually embraced residential small lot. I mean, six months ago, everybody was saying, don't touch our single family at all. Now people are okay with residential small lot, which I think is a huge culture change for our city. And if we want to keep having those conversations, I think we need to meet the community halfway. And I, you know, when, when people are saying, no, I don't, I think moving from single family to low rise two is too much too soon, I, I want to listen to that. So um, we're getting a lot of pushback from, um, from, the advocates who have been working to pass MHA for um, many years. I'm a supporter of MHA, but I believe that we need to do this work in collaboration with the community and let the community participate in, in neighborhood planning so that the changes that we're making um, you know, aren't a one-size-fits-all. So um, I, I took a pause on the junction. Uh, again, they are, they are mostly um, a reduction of what is proposed to to the RSL, um, and then I think the other important thing, because one of the questions I was asked to speak to, is how does this all intersect um, with Sound Transit Three? Communities who are likely to be impacted by Sound Transit Three have been uh, pleading with the city to make commitments to do neighborhood planning, and. Um, in, the la in last year's budget process, uh, we did what's called a statement of legislative intent to um, require the Office of Planning and Community Development to come back and tell us how they were going, there's 37 urban villages, how they were going to, and we haven't done neighborhood planning in 25 years, how they were going to prioritize doing neighborhood planning for, or, or, or neighborhood plan updates for those communities who need it. Um, I'm happy to report that OPCD agrees that they should be prioritizing uh, neighborhood planning in areas um, that are impacted by Sound Transit 3, and they have made a commitment to begin planning conversations uh, both with Delridge uh, and with the West Seattle Junction uh, in 2019 and in earnest begin planning in 2020. And I, again, I think that that is going to create a really a helpful groundwork in order to have these conversations that are really important to have about transit-oriented development and where to um, truly inc increase uh, development capacity around, around transit. And um, so West Seattle Junction. And then there are, um, there are a couple small, there's a, a small area in, um, there's two, two requested changes that I, I've been working with MOCA on. Uh, in Morgan, there is one reduction again from um, from a proposed low rise three for an area that is currently single family. Um, they are asking for it to go to low rise two. Very reasonable, right? I hope I can get these amendments passed because I think what the community is asking for is incredibly reasonable, and again has uh, has really to me demonstrated um, a lot of less polarization about about MHA um, and more of a coming together. And then um, there's a, a small area in um, in South Park. 
that is actually an increase in proposed zoning. Um, and then there are two, two areas in, in Westwood Village. So as mentioned, there's going to be a public hearing next week um, where you know I've developed a set of amendments that reflect the work that I've been doing with these communities. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, there's a public hearing next week, so that doesn't mean that's the end of the discussion. Um, if folks want um, to work on additional amendments, as I've mentioned to both Rick um, and Laura in the past, I'm happy to have that conversation. Um, I've had you know business districts in other parts of the city come to me and ask for my help um, on these issues. The university district um, came to me and asked for my help when we were doing the university district amendments because they wanted the AV taken out of the package um, until they had time to do an economic um, analysis. Um, and they came to me because they couldn't get any help from other council members. Um, I, you know, I routinely work with folks in, in the business district to try and make sure that city policies reflect their needs. So I'm a resource for you, and if you want to make some changes to this proposal, I'm happy to put them on the, on the table. That's, I think, all I have for now. Can I open it up? Yeah. So I want to go back to the neighborhood planning piece that you just yep. talked about, and specifically with North Delridge, because North Delridge was fortunate that they just were able to do uh, some planning updates. The problem is, is that plan never has not been approved by council. We have a um, we have a resolution that we're working on, but that's a you know that's the North Delridge action plan. It doesn't actually include any zoning changes. But yes, we have um, we're, we've been working with Michael Taylor Judd on a resolution. I'd be happy to send you a copy of it. But my point was going to be that it's a very long and drawn out process because just updating the North Delridge yeah. action plan has been, what, five years now? Yeah. You know, so uh, I'm just worried that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it gets drug out. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think uh, for those of us who participated in the original neighborhood planning <laughs> process, it is a, a, a long process, and um, I think part of the reason is because true in community engagement, like, like we did back in the mid 90s, late 90s, to do neighborhood planning, um, it takes time to do it. Um, but you're absolutely right about North Delridge. North Delridge has been ready for a year and a half. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I, I think, I mean, just to be fair, I think that some of that had to do with changing administrations. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes a new mayor comes in and there's a body of work that was done before them, and they're kind of not ready to let go until they really understand it. So I think that was part of the holdup with North Elridge. But we are going to work on recognizing that plan. The other point that I wanted to make is that with all of this increased density, and I, I understand that we need the density, is there seems to be, and it's not even an afterthought, no thought given to, to working on the infrastructure that all this density is dying into. So just to use my neighborhood of pitch and point, for example, we have taken on a lot of density over the last 24 to 36 months. Mm -hmm. And it's all being tied into an infrastructure that in some cases is almost 100 years old. Yeah. And at some point, we're already seeing failures of that infrastructure. And as we put more and more uh, uh, impact onto that existing infrastructure, where when are we going to start dealing with that issue? Well, um, this is one of the issues that the environmental impact statement looked at. Right? They looked at the impacts of these relatively small up zones um, on the infrastructure needs of the city and identified um, where those impacts needed to be mitigated and, and identified how the city was mitigating them. And so as it relates specifically, I can <coughs> speak to... Um, to transit. I mean, the mitigation for, for transit is, um, in, in some cases, is uh, rapid ride, right? That's the, the short-term mitigation. The longer-term mitigation, you know, would be 703, but that's, that's a ways away. But it's increasing bus service. It's rapid ride. It's uh, Prop 1, the uh, Transportation Benefit District, where um, Seattle has uh, paid Metro King County for additional bus service uh, for... Um, <laughs> for 
out public utilities. You know, we have a strategic business plan that is a plan to invest hundreds of millions of dollars, funded by your 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 rates, um, to deal with the um, the utility infrastructure. So, you know, there are there have been questions by um, members of the community about whether or not that EIS um, adequately um, measured those impacts and the plan, the city's plans to address those impacts. You know, that went before um, the hearing examiner, and the hearing examiner uh, found that the city uh, was lacking in, in only one area, and that was um, as it relates to an inventory of historic resources. And so we are, through the amendment process, we're going to be making, discussing, and potentially making some changes um, to the MHA proposal in areas that have established historic districts. Um, so the, there, we have um, in the citywide MHA program, so both in the, uh, the Chinatown International District and the Pioneer Square District, we exempted those historic districts from the upsums. And there are two other historic districts that, um, that we have flagged as a result of the EIS process and hearing standard <laughs> determination. Um, that should be that should be considered to be pulled. So um, one's in Madison and one's in uh, Ravenna Cowan Park. So that's the results of that asking and answering that question about impacts. And um, you know I could get you like so the EIS is a pretty fat document, but I think I could get you information about sort of each piece of infrastructure that was that was looked at in what the sort of what the city's answer was to that and how the hearing examiner found adequacy if you wanted to delve more deep, deeply into it but that's what that whole process was all about until we get light rail can you exempt us from tunnel tolls west <laughs> 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 uh, in a special place <laughs> I, I agree um, we got to talk to the state about that but okay. no we're um you know, it's we don't have other options like folks, other folks do, to avoid the tolls. We really don't. Um, but again, that's a that's a wash dot decision. The city of Seattle has nothing to do with that. <laughs> so, so to follow up on uh, Pete's question with regard to infrastructure and then upzoning and so forth, how does can you, can you know, how does that uh, plan work together? So we're not upzoning before we have infrastructure. And, and how is that? How is that planned out? Well, again, um, using the SPU uh, Seattle Public Utilities Strategic Business Plan, it's a six-year plan for major infrastructure um, improvements to um, all of the SPU's lines of business. Um, so sewer, um, wastewater, and and those investments are planned out over a period of six years, and the funding to do those investments are planned out over six years. Yeah, so, so it's all based, those making the determination of what those investments are is all based on uh, an analysis of what the additional needs are going to be from the growth. So so does the zoning then, is it a, is it a, a rolling implementation of the zoning, or is the zoning just... No, but... It's not like the developers all come all at once and tear down all the property and Understood. <laughs> Understood. so so the, the, the zoning does is not rolled, but neither is the development. I mean, the, but the development is rolled. It, it it doesn't happen all at once. It happens a little bit at a time over yeah. a period of. Well, I, under, I understand that. In this case, I'm twenty years is the planning period. Trying to understand so that so that we it, it, does this when, when this goes into. Does it all go in at once? Yes. Think, okay. Yeah. So essentially, development could happen in places where infrastructure has not been upgraded. Yeah, it could. Just like it is now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions. One, looking at the map, uh, especially up and down California Avenue, mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff proposed for upzoning uh, includes a lot of the small local mom and pop shops. Uh, what consideration for displacement was put into that? I know my restaurant will be in the zone of getting torn down. We've seen like fine and spoon when it gets opened back up. Uh, it's fifteen thousand dollars a month in rent, and you can't make that. 
So then it gets filled in with local chains or chains. Uh, is there any programs outside of the legacy business programs? Is there anything taken into consideration for developers to have any sort of, of breaks towards businesses or small locally owned businesses? So um, that's question one. These <laughs> changes are uh, land use in nature, and we have included um, in our amendments some changes that are focused on. But again, this is this is. These are land use. This is about how the space is used, and that's the limitations of, of this legislation. Um, and so uh, there are a set of amendments that are specifically designed to um, address the needs of uh, neighborhood commercial districts to have small spaces. And so um, the requirements will, will not allow for larger uh, commercial spaces um, in in some of those areas. It will also have different requirements for setbacks with the idea that if developers are building smaller spaces, then the rents will be less um, expensive than for the larger spaces. And um, it will also help us maintain our local businesses instead of having local businesses compete with big box businesses for those spaces. We're kind of taking those folks out of the equation with the idea that that will affect the market. Um, if if the big businesses can't compete for those spaces because they're not big enough, then that will affect the market rents. It's not a, I'm not going to pretend like it's a panacea though, right? But it is within the context of this proposal, it is the kind of thing that we can do. Because again, this is about the spaces. Okay. Yeah, the smaller footprint is smaller rent. So even if that price per square foot goes up, it, it makes it really hard for small businesses to continue to exist. Um, on top of that, workforce housing really concerns me. I've had multiple employees of mine that live in West Seattle who currently, previously have lost their, their spaces because it was a single family home. It's being land banked for future development. They lost the uh, affordable housing that had been paid off and could be cheaply uh, rented out to people. Uh, this proposal currently doesn't have any requirement, and I've, I've gone through several forums to ask this question and have not received an answer, uh, to put the money back into the neighborhood. Like, we can tear out all the, the currently affordable rent, go higher in West Seattle, and it goes into the city fund, because I hear that's the direction most developers are appreciating, is to pay that out. How do we get that investment back into West Seattle? Like, I, I would love to see a zip code, like it's within a zip yeah. code or two. And so the area. legislation actually does address this. In the, and that's the framework legislation that was passed in 2016. Mm -hmm. And so all of the all of the individual up zones and the citywide up zone all relate mm -hmm. back to the framework legislation. And it directs the Office of Housing to spend the resources in the in the neighborhoods from where the resources derived, and um, I think I have. Um, and so that's for the that's for the, the 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 payment requirement. Obviously, for the performance requirement, those will be those will be on site. So um, for the performance requirement, and we're again fifty percent of um, uh, of Developers are expected to perform on site. And then with the money that goes to the Office of Housing to issue through a request for proposals, a competitive request for proposals among nonprofit housing developers, OH is directed to fund those projects that go back into the communities from where from where the um, the, the fees have derived. And so we have a we have a let me just finish up that train of thought. Um, prior to having this mandatory housing affordability program, we have a program called um, incentive zoning. It's like MHA, but it was voluntary. Um, under incentive zoning, um, you can get extra height if you pay. Whereas now, we're giving you extra height. You can use it or not. You still got to pay. Um, so, but with incentive zoning, we also had that principle that the dollars. Um, that are derived in a community come back to that community to develop affordable housing. And we've actually been recognized nationally um, among other cities that have these kinds of programs as performing the best of other cities. And you can see that this is, um, I, didn't, I didn't bring extras and I'm happy to give
give this to you, but these, all these yellow and orange dots over here, all over here, are examples of the incentive zoning um, uh, investments. And there aren't that much for West Seattle, but we have very little incentive zoning in Seattle. We only have it around the Pomeroy Triangle right now. Um, and so, again, I think this shows a really good track record um, of spreading the dollars around as they come in from those communities. So I guess the one question to clarify, I appreciate the answer. What is the definition of the community that it comes from? Is, is Morgan Junction go back to Morgan Junction? Yeah. Alaska goes back to Alaska? Or is it like D1? What's it's um it's more specific. It's not it's more specific than the district, right? It's it's more focused on the planning concept that the city uses. So it's more focused on things like the urban villages. So if the rezone happens in the Alaska Junction, the money goes back in the Alaska Junction? That's that's what we're directing the Office of Housing to do. And by direct that means required, correct? Or well, like, please. <laughs> it, it, it's more of a please, but we'll be monitoring it. Okay. So, so when you say the money goes back in, and, and I'm, I guess I'm trying to translate some of the, this, this infrastructure speak to reality, which is we're talking about affordable housing, and I've always wondered how affordable housing happens in a city like this without making micro units or dormitory rooms that it qualifies as an apartment. Um, and so it usually gets back to subsidized rent. Is that correct? So when I talk about affordable housing, I'm focused on the housing that our nonprofit developers build. We have, you know, organizations that you might have heard of, like the Low Income Housing Institute, Capitol Hill uh, Housing Improvement Program. Um, so what does that what does that there, mean? What does that mean? I, I, we fund them, the city, with our housing levy dollars and housing trust fund dollars from the state, federal dollars, and county dollars. We fund them to build affordable housing. From a, and affordable housing is a uh, it's anything under eighty percent average median income, and uh, hundred percent average median income in Seattle is about is about uh, ninety thousand. Um, but in the reality, most of our providers are focused on under sixty percent AMI, and so that's the housing they're building. They're building that housing of because they are. They're about serving people. They build housing of all different unit sizes. So they, 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 those, those, those providers will build studios, but they'll build family size units as well. They're actually building more family size units than the, the, um, the market rate housing developers do because they're mission based and they know that they're not there to make a profit. They're there to serve our community. And so they know that we have a great need for family-sized housing in this community, so that's why they're building it, even knowing that that is going to impact their um, their bottom line, basically. Is it possible to turn the please into a do it? Um, <laughs> I might lose my business out of this whole thing that I get for the betterment of the community. Like, it is what it is, so I can back that if I actually know that there's a benefit back into the community I live in. Yeah. So is, there, is that legal, legislatively possible? And what would be the downturn to doing it? So, is it legislatively possible? Um, so, the way the money is um, allocated is it's a uh, competitive process, right? And so, last year, um, there was what's called a request for proposal for $70 million um, of housing levy money and incentive zoning money and a little bit of MHA money from the areas where we've already Im implemented incentive zoning. Um, in the request for proposal, the city says what it wants, um, the type of housing, who it serves, and where they want to see it. And then the propos proposals come in, and the city awards the best proposal. So this last um, this last cycle, there was probably $200 million worth of proposals. We had $70 million to, to, to issue. And so um, it's difficult to require OH. I don't want to be in a position where we're requiring OH to fund a bad project, right? If the only project that a developer, a, a nonprofit developer, <laughs> is proposing for um, the junction is a project that um, isn't competitive according to how OH 
um, does its allocations, I don't want to be in a position where I'm responsible because of that requirement. I, I, I respect OH's process, and they, in turn, we have something called the ANF plan, the Administrative and Financial Plan, and we're, you know, we're pretty clear with them about the types of projects and where, um, and it's where the, you know, it's a balance of, it's the balance of power between an, the executive departments of the mayor and the um, the council. We set policy, they implement, and it's our job to do oversight to make sure that they're implementing our policy. And so that's that's the way we accomplish that. I really don't know how we would make this a requirement of the Office of Housing. But they will be held accountable for how well they fulfill our policy intent. Um, so how many additional doors of housing, if, if this is fulfilled 100% over 20 years, whatever, like in your numbers, how many additional people is that? Um, it's not translated into numbers of people, it's 6,000 units or 6,000 households. And so some of those households will be multi-unit households. Or and multi-people households. So citywide? Right. Or citywide, yeah. Citywide. So we don't have that broken down for District 1? We do. I don't have it with me, though. Okay. <laughs> and so I think it's about 500 in, in district. 500 additional. Yeah. And, uh, and again, we'll be monitoring that because right. we've set these goals. And uh, no, no, I don't, I don't mean affordable housing. I mean housing in oh, general. No. These, are, these are the affordable units. Okay. Yeah. How many more of, if, if this <laughs> upzoning is fulfilled, right. how many more people right. is that? How many more households is that? So, you know, this is very rough right. thumb. Um, it's, I mean, we're supposed to be planning in this next planning period for an additional 70,000 households. So over the next 20 years. 70,000 households. Yeah. Citywide. Citywide. Yeah. Citywide. Yeah. And so, so how many in District 1? I, I don't know off the top of my head. So we'll say 20%. We're 20% of the population now, so 20% of that, so 20%. So that's 14,500 more bathrooms. I've been hearing that a lot lately. Where, where does it say we're 20% of the population? I just made that up. Oh, okay. No, I've, I've heard that a lot lately. Um, yeah. But we're 7th we're of the population, right? Because the districts are um, divided up by population. So, um, but... This is not the first time. I think there's something out there that so, says that we're a bit of the population. So 14,000. So what is the dollar amount we're looking to raise from that development? I, I know that I know the unit number. All right. Thank you. I can get it for you though. Okay. Easily.
tree ordinance. So it will also apply um, to um, areas that are under development under MHA. How much of this rezoning and, and condensing, like, is there a ratio of like how many are going to be rental, lease versus unit purchase? Because what I've seen is that the, the lease market has eased up as, you know, question is um, I guess around what I've seen on the the money that's in the funds to get low-income housing built. and you've been talking about RFPs from the city which means the city owns the property and they're trying to get somebody to come in and build on it no the city isn't necessarily owning the property in, in some cases on we, private, we, if I own a piece of property privately yeah. and I want to put a 100% affordable housing yes. development on that piece of property, how do I apply for that money if the city doesn't issue an RFP for that project? Um, you write a proposal for that project. And it, in some cases, can include um, acquisition, right? You can maybe have a purchase and sale agreement. For, you have, maybe you don't own the property yet. And it, we don't, um, we fund projects all through the development process from acquisition um, to construction, uh, well, I should say acquisition, pre-development, construction, and rehab. We fund we fund projects that are what, what we call in our portfolio. That's all these little dots. These are not city-owned properties. These are <coughs> properties that are owned by nonprofits. Um, and sometimes those properties need upkeep, upkeep. And so we also um, fund through this competitive process um, maintenance funds to um, you know make a building seismically fit or put in a sprinkler system or you know whatever might come up. And so it's it's a grant writing process. That's basically what it is, is you write a, a, a grant for what you want to build in that space and who you want to serve and what you're going to charge for rents. And you prove to the city that you're, um, 
you know, going to be able to maintain the building. We're, you know, we're mostly, you know, there's probably about 20 nonprofit developers um, that work in Seattle, King County, and most of these people are um, outfits that we've worked with for a long time and are trusted partners. You know, we've, the city has, uh, through the generosity of our voters, have been funding housing levies since 1983. So there's a long history of this development process and partnership. So developers get the money, they pay the fee, the city does the RFP, let's say Lehigh builds the building, Lehigh owns that building and operates that building, the city does not have, does not possess, so that money goes from the taxpayer, or the developer goes to the nonprofit organization. That's right. So we're just transferring, okay. Uh, what are the requirements on... Uh, Someone has a question behind you. Oh, sorry. That's okay, we're patient to have Go ahead. Uh, what are the performance metrics for those? I know Lehigh's had issues in the past hitting specific metrics in previous bids. What are, have you guys gone through how that money's spent with them? Or so I think counted? you might be talking uh, not about the money that's administrated through the Office of Housing for purposes of building housing, but you're probably talking about the money that is administered through the Human Services Department for the provision of services. Okay. Um, and um, we have moved to what's called a... Um, outcomes-based contracting. I, um, when I was the budget chair um, two years ago, I introduced legislation that I sponsored um, to require HSD to have all of its contracts, 100% of its contracts, um, use outcomes-based contracting. And um, as it relates specifically to homeless services, we've, um, we've been seeing better outcomes. We need to, there's more work to be done. Um, but basically, um, if the outcomes aren't met. There's performance pay that they that those organizations don't get, and it also hurts their ability to apply in in the future. If um, the city tries to work with them when they don't meet their outcomes to, to meet them, but at some point um, there's a, there'll be another RFP, and the city has to sort of decide whether or not that's still a good partner. So in the interest of time, we're going to take a couple more questions. Okay, is that right? I want to hear. Jim, yeah. in the you say you're working on a tree ordinance. Will you? Directly looking have the tree owners who plant their own trees. Are you going to try and mandate that they stay, or they remain as property of the owner? So there's a um, there will be a sort of more robust per permitting process um, where the um, owner of the property, if they want to cut the tree, either for development purposes or because it's an unhealthy tree, um, they have to come in and get a permit from the city. It's a low cost permit. Um, and um, the original proposal is they had to have an ar arborist certify that it was um, an unhealthy tree because we were having, I mean, we honestly were having problems with people coming in and saying that their trees were unhealthy and using that as a loophole to cut down perfectly healthy trees. But um, we're, we're not requiring an arborist, we're current requiring a, a tree professional, but that, that legislation is still in development. <laughs> um, we've been working with um, Tree Pack and um, the Open Open Space Coalition and um, the Urban Forestry Commission on it. Um, and check, check in with Alex; he can give you a, a lot more of the details. I've heard it be, be, permit to be a review fee about twenty five hundred dollars. Um, so there's there's a couple different things, right? There's the um, the review and, and the permit. Um, which is designed to be very low cost because we, we want people to comply. We don't want them to skirt it. <laughs> um, but the, the the replacement costs for replacing trees, um, you know, for trees that are healthy trees, um, there are some costs associated with cutting down healthy trees, um, and that those funds go into a fund um, that the city uses to play uh, to replant trees. And that's private places. property. The people planted the tree there, and now you're coming along and saying you're going to take it away. Well, I mean, we've, we've That's talked... That's condemnation about representation. Yeah. Um, we've talked about other issues, like drainage issues today around MHA. Uh, tree canopy is really important to being able to make sure that we don't have flooding in our communities, and so we have to do everything we can um, to maintain tree canopy. It's really important to the health of our community. Um, particularly it, when, you know, for areas that are uh, abutting in, in, in District 1 that are uh, abutting industrial areas, 
um, tree canopy is really important. And it's a, it's a balance that we have to strike with, with development. I'm sorry, Debbie? <laughs> That's why I'm proposing amendments to um, for the junction, um, amendments that the junction have asked me to propose because they want to do planning around the alignment. And so that's why my amendments don't allow any of the current single family to be upzoned above RSL. The proposal from the executive um, increases the zoning from anywhere from low rise one to all the way up to low rise three. And I don't agree with that. I'm having a hard time convincing some of my colleagues. So. But the final where the route is going to go, that's not final right yet either, is it? No, it, um, we, the, uh, I'm a member of the elected leaders group. We're not a decision making body. We give advice to Sound Transit Board, but we aren't uh, planning on making a recommendation until I believe May. And then the Sound Transit Board, and then we have to do this whole <coughs> environmental impact statement um, uh, process. Also, around the there won't just be uh, one alternative; there'll be multiple alternatives, probably two. Um, and so there has to be an environmental impact statement around those two alternatives. But um, that will allow us to begin doing neighborhood planning around some specific alternatives, um, and then that will allow us to have another conversation about different zoning to support um, the needed housing around light rail. So thank, thank you very much. Lisa, if, if, there's a, yeah. if people have other questions, where can they send them to um, for, to have you answer them? Yeah, lisa.herbal at seattle.gov. And she does. She answers her email very promptly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and not just for me. Uh, um, well, is there anything that you would like to add in summation? Uh, um, you know, again, I, I, guess I said before, I'm really, I'm really proud of the West Seattle community for moving to a place um, of um, outright opposition to collaboration, and it's, it's, it's been a ride. Um, and I just, I'm, I, I could use your help in convincing some of my colleagues to support um, the amendments in the junction. So if, if you um, are thinking about a position to take, that would be a really helpful position to take. <laughs> thank you very much, Lisa. Right. Everyone, thank you.